universities going back to in person in the fall. We've been uh, running on a hybrid model uh, this year with um, a lot of social distancing and then uh, half the students in the classroom spread out and the other half online so as to limit the interaction. Uh, but we're going back to in person in the fall. Okay, I would think most places are in a lot of places still doing hybrid. But... Yeah, most universities are going back. Hello, Ed. I see Ed Sol is here. Uh, Ed Sol. Good to see you, my friend. Hello, Ed. Unmute yourself. Ed, are you hiding? Ed, unmute yourself. Ed, you have to unmute yourself. Right there, how about that? There you go. Happy, happy, happy belated birthday to Ed Sol. Thank you. Birthday. Just had a big birthday. Had a big birthday, is right. Yeah. Got a standing ovation from the state legislature. Right. <laughs> well, thank God to be here. Nice to be alive on this side of the grass. You know that. <laughs> For anyone who doesn't know, Ed Soul is the president and the soul of the United South County Democratic Party. Oh. Thank you very much. That's a nice compliment, really. Well, sir, who do it without you guys? You guys are the best, really outstanding. Thank you. Very much. Did we wait a couple more minutes? I would, I would, you got 116, which is not halfway. Again, it's your decision. There's no comment. It's a Robert, go ahead. You can you can you can start in the middle. Have the have some sort of pledge or introduction, and then then proceed. I think everybody's waiting anxiously to hear Robin. Okay, and we're gonna have Lori speak for a couple of seconds. Uh, that was. Uh, let's uh, wait another two minutes. And, uh, and we'll go yeah, we're up to hundred twenty now. Okay. A lot of people come. Dan yeah. has a stand. Dan, you have a question? It meant to no. Try to get registered. Am, am I on? Am I on? Good. Uh, it, was interesting, it was interesting before hearing someone's, someone say how, uh, uh, what, what is, uh, well, what is now Deming's position on Israel? I think it's time to start focusing on what, what's, what's uh, Rubio's uh, uh, position on democracy and voter suppression. And all the negative things that are going on, and not voting for uh, uh, a, uh, a a nonpartisan investigation of January sixth, we need to focus on Rubio. You know, uh, the concern about is the Democrat pro-Israel. Democrats are always pro-Israel, even if they open their mouth and say Palestinians need to have their own state. Also, the thing is that we have to focus on Rubio and what a lousy record he has, how he's anti-democratic, how he's pro-guns, and, and all the negative stuff about this guy. You have to focus on him. He's raised a lot of money, and we need to, you know, just focus on all the negative, bad things that he's done and how he doesn't care for regular people. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Good point, Dan. I, I think we need to do both. We need to clearly focus on his record, but we also have to give people a reason to vote instead of wanting to not vote against the other. So have to walk and chew gum, but you're right on, Dan, about that. We need to frame it as, you know, why does Rubio want it to be easier to get a gun than to register to vote? Uh, so that's the kind of thing. You know, we were making it easier to get a gun than it is to vote uh, in the state, and we're targeting people in communities of color uh, and economic discrimination and so on. Yeah, we need to call it out. This is we need, on the pale. We need to promote you to do the framing for the candidate. That's what we really need, <laughs> without a doubt. We're, we're blessed to have people like Lori Berman and Ted Deutsch and others in office down here. We have we have some very capable Dems in our area. Um, so I think we need to just continue to support them and give them a, a larger platform uh, so the whole state can listen to the what we're blessed to have down here in Palm Beach County. And do I need to be a co-host as well or no? Just uh, Robert. Just take over. Okay. All right, let's let's get uh, the show on the road. Um, good evening, I'm Paul Mapp, 
former ABC News reporter, and it's my pleasure to welcome everybody to the tonight's South United South County Democratic Club meeting. Um, before we get to our main speaker, we have the privilege of having to hear this, after, this evening from State Senator Lori Berman from the 31st District. Uh, Lori is going to give us an update on the annual legislative session, which uh, just ended about a month ago up in Tallahassee. Uh, Lori, you have the floor. Thank you so much and good evening. And I know that I'm just the appetizer. We have a really great program with Dr. Watson. So I'll try and be brief, even though it was a pretty um, lengthy, arduous session. Um, you all saw it. You read the news. We, they, The Republicans were so emboldened. Um, they passed every, I think the Speaker of the House said he pretty much passed every bill that he needed to pass for his entire two years at this time. Not to say he won't come up with other things next year, but you saw there was the anti-protest bill. I mean, there were so many bills that we are now challenging on constitutional grounds, including the anti-protest bill, including the voter suppression bill. You saw yesterday the governor signed the anti-trans bill um, for no reason. Remember, there are there, in, since 2013, there have been 13 students who have played sports, and I believe only two of them were boys who played girls' sports. So we did this bill for two people, even though we have a system in place. It was just red meat for the Republican base, unfortunately. Um, and we just saw that repeatedly and repeatedly. Today, the governor signed the budget. Um, overall, it was a huge budget. It was $100 million dollars. Um, which is, you know, when I started in 2010, we had like 69 million, I mean, I'm sorry, billion, excuse me, 60. We had a $100 billion budget, we used to have 69 billion. So we've gone up like a third or in that time period. So um, it's kind of funny because Republicans who are, you know, small government, uh, were really happy to take the money from the American Recovery Act. We had no problems doing our budget this year, even though everybody thought because of COVID, it would be such a lean year. But we had our Biden bucks, um, which was great. And we made a point of saying that. And they certainly used them. And I'm glad they did because it, it led to less cuts that we would have seen in, in our state government. But we need to remind everyone that the budget was put together on the back of the American Recovery Act money. Um, today, the governor vetoed many of our Democratic projects here in Palm Beach County. And I'm extremely disappointed. Um, there was a $3 million infrastructure project for our cities that was vetoed. Um, there were some projects for nonprofits that I brought forth that got vetoed. Um, it's really disturbing when you work so hard to get these things in the budget and then to see the governor come and veto them. We did some quick analysis just to see if the vetoes were more on the Democratic side. and. Um, Cleverly, they were not. So um, I don't know. I would imagine that's probably done for the, you know, to make sure that it doesn't look that way. Um, so it was a tough session overall, but we were up there fighting. And I know that my um, colleague in arms, Tina Polsky, is here on the call tonight also with us. So I'm so happy to have her here with us and be a part of it tonight. Um, and um, I just wish you all a very happy summer, you know, COVID numbers are finally coming down. So hopefully we can all get out and start enjoying things. And hopefully we're going to be meeting in person soon. So, so happy to see all of you. And I can't wait to hear Dr. Watson. And thank you all. And really, please go out and enjoy the summer. Thank you, Lori. I'm going to ask everybody to please mute themselves unless they're speaking. So we don't have any interference because we're hearing some background sound on here. Um, tonight's speaker needs no introduction, but I'll just uh, get a hit a few highlights of his accomplishments. An award-winning author, professor, historian, and analyst for various media outlets. He's published over 40 books on history, politics, as well as five works of fiction. He serves as distinguished professor of American history at Lynn University. His favorite president is Harry Truman. Tonight, he will speak to us about President Biden's first 100 days in office and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and there's big news about uh, Israel tonight. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Watson. <clears throat> Robert? Uh, well, thank you, Paul, and I, I wish I had your voice. Uh, that, that is a voice made for the news, so uh, 
mine is always strained from yabbing all day, but that's, that's a great voice. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Dr. Ken, and thank you, uh, Ed, uh, for the invitation to be here. Senator Berman, thank you. I'm a huge fan of Lori Berman's. Uh, we are, and I know I say this all the time, but I mean it, we are really blessed to have leaders like her and Tina Polsky in our, our, uh, in our corner. Uh, Lori is as good as it gets, so uh, we're, we're blessed to have her. And I echo everything she just said about uh, this session and the disappointments with it. Also, hi, to, I see recognize so many of you, Claire and Carol and Les and Linda and Debbie and uh, Lenore, oh my goodness, Abby, Tara. Uh, so good to see all my friends out there. Uh, I'm gonna share screen. I put a PowerPoint together for all of you just because there's so much to talk about. And I have some lists and I'll be happy to send these to Ed and Dr. Ken uh, later so they can share it with everybody. I hope everybody can see this okay. Uh, so there's the, the blah, the blah, okay? So, all right, let's jump into this. So where to begin? Um, you know, I'm gonna try to hustle through this. There's just so much to talk about. But so first off, we've got to talk about the Republican assault on voting rights. This is shocking. Uh, we've not seen anything quite this organized and large scale since Jim Crow at the end of uh, Reconstruction, uh, which was the post-Civil War program envisioned by Abe Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, uh, which ended in uh, April, uh, excuse me, in, in April of 1877. So uh, there's been a massive assault on voting. Here's the irony. The Republican war on voting is a solution looking for a problem. There is no problem, as you heard Senator Berman say earlier, the same with sports and the trans community. There is no problem. They're fabricating it. In fact, it's the opposite. The Republicans are not trying to suppress voting because people didn't vote. They're trying to suppress voting because people did vote. Uh, we had record turnout. Uh, over two-thirds of eligible Americans voted, 67%. Uh, that's the highest since the year 1900, everyone, although that's kind of a false analogy because in 1900, it was two decades before women got the right to vote in the 19th Amendment. So only uh, wealthier white men were voting. Uh, so this is this was truly in 2020 an extraordinary turnout. Uh, look at the numbers here on the screen. Over 17 million more people voted um, in 2020 than voted in uh, 2016. That's extraordinary. Uh, not only was it up overall, but we saw a huge surge in early voting and voting by mail. Uh, all across this country, uh, and this explains the great increase. So what are the Republicans doing? Because early voting works so well, they're trying to tear it apart and limit it. Because voting by mail works so well, they're assaulting that right as well. In fact, we saw turnout increase all across this country in every demographic. Black turnout was up in the, from the previous election, 63% as opposed to 60. Latino turnout was up from 48% to 54%. Asian American turnout from 49 to 59, 10 points. Uh, youth turnout from 49 to 57. I don't think we were expecting that. Even senior turnout was up 71 to 74. So across this nation, a remarkable turnout in voting. What makes it all the more impressive is that uh, it occurred during a global pandemic. So elections offices all around the country were understaffed. We didn't have the number of volunteers. There were health concerns. And yet, all across the country, county by county, election office by election office, in a matter of just four days, they were able to count a record number of votes and uh, release the results. So we did not, if, if anything, it was the opposite. What happened in 2020 was textbook, it worked. So the Republicans are attacking the entire system. Uh, it has to be said that this is reminiscent of Jim Crow. Uh, you've heard commentators around the country make this uh, analogy. I'm certainly uh, someone who's been making it. It's Jim Crow 2.0. Um, so to understand uh, this attack, let's put it in historic context. Uh, Reconstruction, as I said, went from 1865 to 1877. It was the policy of Lincoln to rebuild the South, i.e. Reconstruction, to provide basic rights and freedoms uh, for former slaves uh, and to bring the South into the fold, a policy of forgiveness, magnanimity, uh, and, and reuniting the entire nation, which he laid out in a second inaugural when he appealed uh, that both sides had drawn the sword and he appealed for union uh, and, and for coming together. Uh, so as soon as the Civil War ended, the KKK was formed, 
uh, established in Pulaski, Tennessee in uh, 1867 after the Civil War. And Jim Crow became a caricature in those years afterwards. The genesis, the origins of the name Jim Crow are multiple. One, there was a popular song, Jump Jim Crow, which was a song that was quite frankly a disgusting parody. It made fun of uh, slaves, Jump Jim Crow, and you can see uh, Jim Crow here dancing, uh, his shoe uh, open at the end and flying off while he jumps around. Uh, it was also a traveling minstrel show. Um, it was, these were quite popular uh, in the 1800s. A wagon uh, would come into town and there would be a puppet show and they would have different kind of puppets. One of them was typically black and the white puppet would smack and slam the black puppet and everybody would applaud. I guess that was entertainment in that racist uh, day and age. Also, um, white actors and comedians would don blackface, uh, overly enhanced the lips, and would dance around tripping and falling, looking like a fool, and that was a, a disgusting portrayal of black. So all this, the blackface, the minstrel shows, um, uh, the Jump Jim Crow song, this is Jim Crow, and Jim Crow really became known for two things then. It was a, a, a term that implied African American or black. Uh, so Jim Crow was synonymous uh, with black folk. And um, secondly, the effort in the South to, um, to push back on Reconstruction and limit uh, the right to vote. And of course, in those years after the Civil War, part of Jim Crow was uh, outlawing throughout the South interracial marriages. Uh, outlawing blacks were not allowed to be literate. You could even be punished if you were white and teaching someone who was a former slave to be educated. Property, uh, there were zoning laws restricting ownership and where blacks could be, basically an apartheid setup. And of course, all the tricks of the trade to deny voting rights during Reconstruction, that is literacy tests, grandfather clauses, and poll taxes. Um, so that was the ugly legacy of Jim Crow. And here's some pictures, including on the lower left right here in South Florida, some disgusting pictures of segregation and the vestiges of uh, Jim Crow. Uh, we saw a number of court cases all the way to the Supreme Court reaffirming Jim Crowism, including Dred Scott on 1857, whereby the Justice uh, Roger B. Tawney ruled that no black man has a right that a white man must respect. Uh, and former slaves could be returned to slavery even if they were free and free blacks could be returned to slavery, as was uh, the case in the uh, 1850 um, Fugitive Slave Act. Uh, then we saw at the end of that uh, century, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, which I wrote on the board here, that's 1896. Homer Plessy was, um, was uh, biracial. He was seven-eighths white, one-eighth black uh, in Louisiana, and he was riding on a train, and um, Plessy was an activist. Uh, and if you look at Plessy, he looks white. He looks like he played the guitar for ZZ Top or an extra on Duck Dynasty with his big beard. Um, Plessy was an activist. Uh, the train cars in Louisiana were segregated, white and colored, quote unquote. Uh, Plessy sat in the white section and was arrested. Um, he was arrested. Now, how would they know he was white, uh, black? He looked white. Uh, but Plessy was an activist, so he was always on the police uh, watch list, so to speak. Louisiana was so racist, everybody, there's vestiges of Jim Crow, that if um, you were 132nd black, you were labeled as black. If you were 132nd Latino, you were labeled as Latino. They even had terms, debate, depending on whether you're one half, one eighth, one sixteenth, whatever, uh, black. Plessy being one eighth black, the official term in Louisiana, get this, everyone, he was an octoroon. That meant you were one-eighth black, an octoroon. This is how bad uh, Jim Crow had been. Uh, Plessy appealed. His case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And Plessy versus Ferguson, it was decided against Homer Plessy. The ruling was, as you all know, separate but equal. Uh, you know, blacks can ride in a dirty, crowded section of the train, but they, quote, unquote, have equal access to transportation. You can have a white school that has books and teachers and desks. The black school is crowded with holes in the wall and no teachers, but students, quote unquote, have equal access to an education. 
we all know separate's not equal. And that would be the law of the land until 1954, one of the longest vestiges of Jim Crow, not until Brown v. Board, uh, until Thurgood Marshall brought a case in Topeka, Kansas, right, everyone? Uh, involving Linda Brown, a young black woman who was a stellar student who was denied admission to, um, uh, to the uh, white school. So Brown v. Board in 1954 ultimately overturned uh, uh, Jim Crow. Now, the kicker was, uh, even though Brown v. Board was a desegregation case, all across the South, desegregation did not occur. It did not occur because conservatives and Southerners dug in with something called the WCC, the White Citizens Council. I've been using this analogy that's described Mitch McConnell, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, as their contemporary White Citizen Council leaders. What the WCC was, these White Citizens Councils, they formed all across the South, uh, and they formed as a way of, of, of denying uh, desegregation. So let's say you had an impressive attorney and political leader like Lori Berman, and let's say she was trying to bring a case for desegregation. What the White Citizens Councils would do is they would bring social pressure against her. The principal of the school might be in the WCC, and he or she would throw, uh, you know, Lori's child out of school. Um, the banker uh, would, would say that you can no longer bank. The police chief would have someone arrested uh, and trumped up charges made. Uh, if you were a member of the country club, you'd go to the club, they would say they have no record of your membership and throw you out. Because all these community leaders were members of the WCC, so they brought social pressure against uh, folks. There's a, a, a re remarkable book about this era called 58 Lonely Men by a scholar named Peltison, and it tracks the 58 federal judges serving across the South. Uh, they were mandated after 1954 with desegregating apropos the um, uh, Brown v. Board case. What happened was uh, all these 58 federal judges, they did not do the right thing. Rocks were thrown through their window. Letters were given to them saying, we know where your wife or your child you know, is. Uh, crosses were burned on their yard. Police harassed them. And therefore, they cowered and did not rule to desegregate. So it took years before that. Uh, the three main, uh, you see them on the screen here, the three main, I guess, uh, measures to end the legacy of Jim Crow, of course, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, of course, and we all know about that, uh, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, uh, and the 24th Amendment, which was in 1964, which finally legally ended poll taxes, literacy tests, grandfather clauses, and so on. So all that was used to push back against the disenfranchisement of communities of color. And of course, here we are today, uh, a big step forward, followed by a, by a big step uh, backward. The Republicans are bringing back the Jim Crow. You're all well aware of this. I know that the club's been talking about it. I know that Senator Berman, Tina Polsky, and other leaders, Dr. Ken and others have been talking about it. Um, according to a number of organizations, we've had roughly 361 bills in 41, 47 states all these promoted by Republican legislatures. A total of 833 Republican bills were introduced across the country. Just absolutely shocking. Um, and um, what they're trying to do is, I made a laundry list for you. Uh, you're all probably well aware of them. To reduce early voting, as I said at the outset, why? Because it worked. This is a solution in search of a problem. Um, early voting, uh, to reduce early voting, to reduce voting by mail, to eliminate same-day registration, to reduce drop boxes. This is something in 2020 that Republican counties, Republican states did. Uh, they might put, let's say, one drop box per county. Could you imagine a county, the geographic size of Palm Beach County, from Boca Raton in the south all the way up past Jupiter, if there was one voting, uh, one drop box out near Okeechobee? It would be, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't work. Um, aggressive identification requirements. Uh, they're limiting groups from registering voters. They're eliminating Sunday voting. That is a, a, an obvious racist attempt uh, to go after black churches and the longstanding practice that we call souls to polls. Uh, black churches will have folks meet on a Sunday, gas up the buses, have an info session, and let everybody have lunch and go out to vote. So that is simply an attempt to deny blacks from voting. 
Uh, in 2020, they already did this, and now Republicans around the country are trying to, to limit voting rights by simply, blatantly closing precincts in communities of color. Alabama did that this last go-around. And shockingly, in some of the most egregious states, Georgia and elsewhere, Texas, they're prohibiting people from offering assistance. Get this, everybody. If you're Bubby, your abuela, your Nona, your Yaya, your grandmother's in line, you cannot go up and give her a bottle of water, a chair, or an umbrella if it's raining. So I don't know about all of you, but if we get there in Florida uh, in the, the uh, midterm election of 2022, I hope you all join me. I'm bringing bottles and bottles of water to hand them out to anyone that looks thirsty. If it's raining, I'm bringing small umbrellas to hand them out to everyone that looks like a grandparent that happens to be in line. And we need to force uh, civil disobedience, force them to try to dare to arrest us for giving a bottle of water to an 85-year-old standing in a hot, long line uh, trying to vote. This is what the Republicans are doing. How your frame, you mentioned framing earlier, how in any way is this uh, family values, okay? Um, Florida's up to it. As you know, DeSantis just signed a measure. We're now the eighth state to roll back uh, the right to vote. Uh, Florida's reducing drop boxes, promoting aggressive ID requirements, uh, ID requirements if you want to request an absentee ballot in each election. So you can't just request one and have that mailed to you in each election. you got to do it each time, uh, which is bureaucracy and redundancy. Um, no automatic mailing of ballots, even if you want it, even if we know that increases registration and increases turnout. This brings me to another point. I mean, the Republicans have been unmasked as blatant racists, as people who don't care about the Constitution and voting rights. That much has been clear for years. Uh, this is just icing on the cake for them. But uh, it would be one thing if the party was pushing efforts to increase voter turnout, but then trying to make sure there wasn't fraud. They're doing nothing to increase voter turnout, voter awareness, voter education, nothing. Everything is to limit voting rights. As I said off camera at the beginning of uh, this, uh, Republicans are making it easier to get a gun than to vote. There's something fundamentally wrong with that. And that's our frame. That's what we need to say time and time again. They're limiting who can collect ballots. They're limiting involvement by outside groups. There's liability issues. If, uh, if you try to uh, you know, collect and submit ballots, they're empowering partisan election observers. Remember how Republicans were trying to get into um, voting sites to uh, disrupt uh, them. Of course, you need to apply ahead of time as, a, as a, uh, an observer, uh, but this empowers and makes it easier for Republicans to just crash into uh, uh, voting. Uh, the other thing I think we need to talk about is uh, Republicans have an eye, of course, to the 2022 midterms. Um, they can't win fair and square. Uh, they lost in the, uh, the biggest turnout in American history. So what are they trying to do? They're trying to cheat. Uh, so all this has an eye to 2022. You all know that a midterm elections, that is an election when a president is not up for election, the party in the White House does not do well. From the year 1900 to today, the party in the White House has only three times not lost seats. Uh, so the party in the White House always loses seats. That's not good news for us. Uh, 1934, uh, FDR, the Democrats, did not lose seats. But that was an anomaly. That was an exception to the rule because FDR was so extraordinary. Three Republican presidents, Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover, really put us into the Depression uh, through their incompetence and foolish uh, uh, policies. Um, and um, FDR was connecting with the people through his fireside chats uh, and, and the number of measures he pushed to alleviate the pain of the um, Great Depression. So in 34, the party in power did not lose seats. Uh, 1998, Bill Clinton and the Dems did not lose seats because the Republicans were overreaching uh, with their attempted impeachment of Bill Clinton. Uh, and of course, the grotesque hypocrisy of having people like Newt Gingrich, Bob Barr, Henry Hyde, all of whom had far more mistresses than Bill Clinton, uh, lead the impeachment. Uh, um, so uh, the Dems did not lose seats in that 98 midterm. And George W. Bush did not lose seats in the 2002 midterm because we were at war and the country rallied around the flag. 
But you can count on it. The party in power will lose seats in the midterm. That does not bode well for us. We have a majority in the House, but take a look at the Senate. You all know it's 50-50. Gang, we could be looking at the perfect storm in November of 2022, the perfect storm. The Senate's 50-50 right now, and all the leading organizations, uh, uh, Charlie Cook, uh, Larry Sabato, Congressional Quarterly, um, American University, all the groups that really uh, prognosticate and offer handicapping of the upcoming election, they've all said that there are eight Senate seats that are in play in 2022 that could be a 50-50 flip of the coin. Now, here's the kicker. We're at 50-50, and of the eight Senate seats that are in play, you guessed it, um, there's four Republican, four Democrat. So these are. this is a perfect storm. Four Democratic and four Republican seats. I made a list of them here on the screen for you. Uh, Pat Toomey from Pennsylvania, Republican, is retiring. Um, Raphael Warnock, uh, the black minister in Georgia that just won, he's brand new in the seat. Georgia has traditionally gone Republican, so he's vulnerable. Ron Johnson, who's stark raving and sane and mad uh, in Wisconsin, uh, always conspiracy theories and, and everything else, he's uh, stepping down. Richard Burr, the former chair of the Intelligence Committee, who had one scandal after another uh, and was on the take, as you all know, with insider information uh, during the outset of COVID and not sharing it with his constituents, for God's sakes, investing and divesting based on intel he got about COVID, but then denying that it was a problem for us. Uh, he's the one Rubio took over from him as chair of the Intelligence Committee. Marco Rubio is chair of the Intelligence Committee. My God, if that's not an oxymoron, I've never seen one. Um, so Burr's retiring. North Carolina is kind of a swing state. That could be in play. Mark Kelly, uh, the astronaut in Arizona, uh, he was just elected, so he's vulnerable. Uh, Catherine Cortez Castro in Nevada. Nevada is a swing state. She's new in her seat, the only Latina in the U.S. Senate. She could be vulnerable. Another Democrat, Hassan in New Hampshire, is vulnerable. And Rob Portman in Ohio, uh, that seat could be open. Uh, we would like to add, all of us on this call today, add a ninth seat. That's Marco Rubio. Uh, we we'll hope that that would be vulnerable. I agree with the comments earlier off camera. We need to uh, make a campaign out of the fact that Rubio has been uh, disrespecting the Constitution, uh, supporting conspiracy theorists. After the way Trump treated Rubio, Rubio, Rubio was... Uh, one of Trump's bucket carriers carrying his bucket of water. Um, so we need to uh, add a ninth seat to that, everybody. Um, a little bit about Joe Biden. Uh, you all know Scranton Joe, uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania. I uh, met Joe Biden several years ago. I had to have a nice long talk with him. And um, my family was from Steelton and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. We were uneducated steel mill workers and coal miners. And, and my uh, the town where I was originally from is not unlike Scranton. And when I told Biden that, he got so excited, he gave me a little punch in the stomach, a guy thing. <laughs> um, Biden was brought up in Scranton. His family was poor. Uh, his father struggled economically. Uh, they moved to Delaware in search of a better life. Uh, you all know about uh, uh, Biden's uh, first wife, Nelia Hunter. Um, she was the one who was killed in that horrific car wreck with the 18-wheeler. And they almost lost Hunter and Bo, his sons, who were, what, three and two, and lost his one-year-old daughter. So just a horrific tragedy. Biden always credited the firefighters and EMTs who were on the scene and bravely acted to save the two little boys' lives. Consequently, ever since that horrific accident in uh, 72, Joe Biden has been a friend of, um, of uh, firefighters, EMTs, first responders. No one in Congress has been a supporter that Joe Biden has been for them. Uh, he's never forgotten uh, what they did uh, for his family. I married uh, Dr. Jill Jacobs, 1977. They have four children, uh, one with Jill, and seven grandchildren. I should say that all of the uh, Biden children married Jewish partners, and uh, their grandchildren are all being raised uh, Jewish. There's the modest home on the left. Uh, Biden, by the way, was a two-sport star. Uh, baseball and football. He was a wide receiver and a tailback, uh, quite the athlete, never a good student, 
always struggled with a learning disability, but extremely popular. Teachers and students all really liked it. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, there, I just wanted to show you a picture of Biden's first wife, uh, Neely, because not a lot of people know who she is there. She is with the children right before that horrible car wreck. So we just passed 100 days for Joe Biden a month ago. That's always the period by which we can introspectively you know, sit back and reflect on how is the president doing. The idea of a 100-day assessment, it comes from Napoleon. Yeah, the French said jour, 100 days. Um, that was after Napoleon escaped from his imprisonment um, in 1815. It was from when he escaped from Elba until his uh, failure at Waterloo. So it was a 100-day reign of terror. And uh, around the world, we always use that 100 days since Napoleon to assess how people were doing. Uh, of course, the gold standard for 100 days is FDR. No question about it. This is when he launched his New Deal. FDR kept Congress in session to try to get some relief for the Great Depression. It worked. He got the National Industry Industry Recovery Act. So FDR kept Congress in special session, and he churned out 15 major pieces of legislation in 100 days. That's a record that will never be broken, anybody. Presidents are fortunate if they get two major pieces of legislation in 100 days. FDR had 15, and in dozens and dozens of minor bills, the only one even remotely close, not even LBJ, uh, who had quite a legislative record, the only one even remotely close was Harry Truman. Um, so FDR had five big goals for his 100-day relief program. One, get people back to work. You can see it on the screen there. Two, to protect savings, to bail out the banks. Of course, he called it a bank holiday, so as to not panic uh, people. And then when the banks reopened, they were awash in money, so it kept them from going under. Relief for the poor and elderly, uh, to rescue farms. Remember, the Dust Bowl was uh, happening at the same time. Uh, to promote uh, sustainable agricultural practices like fallow field farming, no-till farming, crop rotation, to save... Uh, farms from the Dust Bowl, and to rescue and support industry. Here's a, a brief list of some of FDR's accomplishments. Um, you all have heard of the Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, the WPA, which would be rebranded as the Public Works Administration. These were huge public works programs, building dams, bridges, schools, hospitals, power, power plants. A lot of our nation's HBCUs, the historically black universities, uh, were built uh, during this particular time. I had to put some numbers over here on the right for everyone. Uh, I am always in arguments with Republicans around the country who there's this Fox News, yet another lie, yet another made up, uh, you know, the, uh, as part of the assault on facts and the truth. This Republican talking point that FDR hurt the economy, didn't help the economy, which is baloney. The proof is in the pudding. Look at the numbers. FDR took office in March of uh, 33. Uh, Look at the numbers here. The stock market grew 20% that month, up 53 the next month, 114, 145. Month after month, unemployment dropped, the economy grew. There was a brief downturn in 37, but then it, it spiked again. He saved capitalism, you might say. Um, let's see here. So here's some factoids for your first 100 days. Uh, I apologize to Paul and Ed and Dr. Ken. Never ask an historian to talk about someone's 100 days. I have to go back to Napoleon. Believe me, I, it was all I could do to not talk about the Battle of Waterloo. <laughs> so um, here's a record for the most laws passed in 100 days. That's FDR at 75. You heard me say the only one close was my hero, Harry, with 55. The fewest laws passed in 100 days was George W., just seven. The most countries visited during the first 100 days, Obama on a whirlwind nine-country tour in his first 100 days to signal uh, that a new administration was in town. No more than George W. Bush with us or against us. Isolationism. Obama was going to be a multilateralist and an international nationalist and engage with the world. And he did. The fewest countries visited. Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Carter, and Trump didn't visit any countries in the first 100 days. The highest approval in the first 100 days, JFK at an astonishing 83%. Even though Trump always said he had the highest approval, in fact, Trump had the lowest approval of any president in the first 100 days at 40%. Uh, Bill Clinton dropped three points in 100 days. 
Kennedy increased 11, Reagan an astonishing increase of 17 points in 100 days because he was shot uh, and the hostages were released from Iran. You can see Biden's at 53 percent approval, which is rather middling. Republicans do not approve. And in this hyper-partisanship day and age, the Democrats do approve. Uh, many events during the first 100 days, Kennedy's Bay of Pigs fiasco, but he learned from it and brilliantly handled the Cuban Missile Crisis the following year. And the Soviets launched the first human into space, which Kennedy would then put the goal of us having a man in space within uh, on the moon within the end of the decade. And we made it summer of 69. Gerald Ford pardoned Nixon, which I do think was the right thing to do, but that pretty much ended any chance of Ford being reelected. Uh, Reagan had the hostage release, which is shrouded in, in uh, conspiracy, and you know that's for another lecture, and was shot by Hinckley. Uh, George W. Bush, the tech bubble bursts, we start the recession, the stock market starts to collapse. And Obama's remarkable Economic Recovery and Reinvestment Act, which was his version of the stimulus. By the way, Bill Clinton's stimulus, which uh, produced record economic growth. Obama's stimulus which brought our budget deficit down from $1.56 trillion a year to just over $400 billion a year. That's a three-quarter reduction. Uh, and brought unemployment down from double digits to four-some percent. Uh, Clinton and Obama's remarkable stimulus plans, uh, which worked wildly beyond any hope, did not have a single Republican vote. So what happened to Joe Biden is not new. Um, Biden's cabinet, just a quick word on his cabinet, this has to be brought up. I'm so excited by Biden's uh, 15 cabinet appointments and a senior aide. Number one, this is the most diverse cabinet in history. Far none, far more than even Obama and Clinton that had some diversity in their cabinets. A record number of black, Jewish, uh, women, Latino, Asian, gay, just remarkable diversity in every shape and form. Three of the four senior cabinet officials are Jewish. Uh, you have the big four uh, state defense, treasury, and justice, and in the other 11, things like HUD, health and human services, agriculture, interior, labor, and so forth, and so on. Um, here's the rest of his cabinet. Uh, you can see the degree of diversity here. And it must be said that uh, it, what's obvious about Biden's cabinet is, is one beyond diversity is something else. Biden took experience and competence over flashy, splashy names. There were a lot of big, splashy names that everybody thought would be go-tos for Biden. Instead, he went with experienced, competent people, which really says quite a bit. He also loaded up his cabinet with a diversity of perspectives and took a step toward the center, which I think is probably the wise thing to do to balance his otherwise rather progressive agenda. There's a list of them. Here's some of the senior advisors. You can see we have women. Asian Americans and others, African Americans, in positions that have never had uh, diversity. And again, a remarkably talented and experienced group of folks. There's a snapshot for everybody in case if you're uh, wondering what they all look like. Uh, these are the cabinet, the 15, and then the senior advisors. And again, I'm really, really excited about this cabinet and all this uh, diversity. Um, so, Biden's first 100 days. Uh, there's something that needs to be said here. Biden took office in the midst of a crisis, no question, uh, as did George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, FDR, Truman, Clinton, and Obama. Uh, Washington and Lincoln are obvious. FDR, the Great Depression and the war. Harry Truman, the post-war order. But Clinton, Obama, and Biden all took office in a crisis to clean up after the economic mess the Republicans left to all three of those Democratic presidents, plus the rise of conspiracies, hyper-partisanship, and a really unruly radical right. Uh, Biden has taken office with not the worst crisis that would clearly be uh, the Civil War, followed by the Great Depression, but the most crises. Uh, look at that. I made a list for you, for you of Biden's inbox. To make his inbox even more problematic, Mitch McConnell violated a 200-year uh, precedent. And you all know about all the things Mitch McConnell has done. Um, because a president needs to hit the ground running, not three days after being inaugurated, not three hours, but immediately, uh, all Senates start to look at their senior appointments to make sure that they're getting them ready immediately. McConnell refused to look 
and Biden's appointments early. So Biden took office and then had to get his team lined up. Good God, there was a, if there was a national security threat, we would have been vulnerable. McConnell put his own partisan nonsense above our nation's security. That's a story we need to tell. He violated a two-century custom. Biden, what is he dealing with? There's my partial list. Hyper-partisanship. The Republicans are not an opposition party, everybody. They are an obstructionist party. There is a difference. We need two viable political parties. We have one political party and a fascist wing. Race relations. The resurgence of white supremacy. Every major organization attracts this numbers. Uh, the ADL, the Southern Poverty Law Center, the FBI, the Brennan Center, uh, since they began tracking these numbers during the Civil Rights Movement, there's been a four-year-long unprecedented spike in hate and in membership of radical right-wing groups, neo-Nazi, KKK, Proud Boys, Oath Takers, and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, the COVID global pandemic, an existential threat of inner global climate change, the rise of conspiracy theories, the attacks on science, reason, and facts. The Republican Party has abandoned the truth, science, and facts. They don't believe in evolution. They don't believe in climate change. They don't believe in COVID. Um, so there's a war on science, reason, and facts uh, and conspiracy theories. The economy. There was a net loss of nearly 10 million jobs under Donald Trump. That is a crisis. Aging infrastructure that Republicans have defeated efforts to renew our nation's infrastructure for years, which to me is inexplicable. Infrastructure is an investment in this country. It's labor intensive. It puts people to work and it's good for business. It's good for commerce. And of course, we've advocated our international leadership under Donald Trump. More on that in a moment. Um, there's been, I have to put something up here amidst, there's two ways to look at this. An EO is an executive order. An executive order is part of a president's toolbox. You do not need co Congress to go along with an executive order. However, executive orders cannot change legislation. They cannot deal with constitutional issues. It's just SOP, standard operating procedure to run the executive government. So there's two ways I want to look at this for all of you. Number one, with this hyper-partisanship and the fact that Mitch McConnell and the Republicans will not agree to anything uh, Biden is doing and saying, he has nothing, no other resort than to use executive orders. So Biden can creatively use executive orders to promote good policies and to govern. The second thing I wanted to bring up, you've heard the Republican talking points on Newsmax, OAN, Fox, and from people like Rubio. Biden has abused and desecrated the office of the president, they're alleging, because he has signed an unprecedented number of executive orders. Um, that's not true. The same was said of Barack Obama, that Obama signed an unprecedented number of executive orders. Take a look at the screen here. Uh, here, I looked up the number of executive orders. Obama signed 276. That's less than W. That's less than Clinton. It's way less than Reagan. It's less than Carter. It's less than Wilson, less than Truman, less than Eisenhower, less than Johnson, less than Nixon. So actually, Obama, Obama was on the low end of executive orders. But you all heard this. The Republican chorus was constantly that Obama is abusing the office because of executive orders. Um, now, what Biden has done, he says, signed 40 thus far. Biden is off to a fast start. Um, here we have in just the first two weeks in office, FDR has the record of 30 executive office. Biden was at 28. So he is off to a fast start. That much can be said. And here's a list for you of executive orders. It has to be said, I have a list here, I can send it to Dr. Ken and Paul and Ed, if, uh, if all of you would like. I made it, this is a partial list. I made a list of how damaging Trump's executive orders were. I was so upset with the media uh, during uh, Trump's presidency. Uh, someone you unmuted, go ahead and, and mute your, yourself. You have your phone on. Um, so go ahead and mute yourself, whoever has your, your, your phone on, okay? Um, so um, so here's what we find. Uh, I, I muted, of course. Um, so um, some of Trump's executive orders, everybody was shocking. I was livid that the media didn't do a good job of reporting it. And once again, the Democrats, 
did not do a good job. Instead, they were focused on scandals. They should have focused on the destructive executive orders. Um, Trump ended a ban on potentially dangerous, potentially carcinogenous pesticides. I mean, how is that making America great again? Uh, he ended the rule requiring chemical factories to inform the public about health and safety risks. Disinfectants that were dangerous and potentially uh, carcinogenous, uh, he allowed them to be sold. He weakened the restrictions. He weakened the limits on uh, safety measures for long-distance trucking. As you know, if truck drivers are driving 30 hours across the country, just like pilots, for every X number of hours they drive, they need downtime. Trump weakened that. A truck could be a weapon of mass destruction with an exhausted driver. Um, he changed the definition of biological products so that the FDA could not regulate things. I mean, shocking. Um, he, of course, as you all know, eliminated the government's pandemic emergency panel right before a global pandemic. Uh, he made it harder for people to sue financial companies. He ended a requirement that airlines have to disclose their baggage fees and hidden, hidden, hidden fees. He made it hard for farmers, family farmers, to sue big agricultural companies. The list continues. He weakened protections for DACA children, the deferred action on child arrivals. Uh, he ended a rule that allowed transgendered folks to serve in our military. Uh, the government used to track pay disparity by race and by sex. He stopped doing it during his four years as president. Uh, there were contractor laws. If you're a contractor with the federal government, there were laws protecting women in the workplace. He undermined those, so there weren't protections for women. He, he limited Title IX sexual assault standards. Uh, he weakened disability rights on college campuses for colleges that were taking federal funding. Uh, and the list goes on and on and on. Visitors to the White House always have to be logged in and recorded, not under Trump. Who the hell knows was visiting the White House? He weakened protections for whistleblowers, auditors, and inspectors general as part of his larger war on ethics. He limited the regulations and reporting requirements for lobbyists. This is the most corrupt administration in history, far beyond Nixon, far beyond Warren Harding. The environment, here's a partial list. He weakened the Endangered Species Act. Uh, he weakened clean air and clean water protections. He weakened the federal government's management of federal lands. Uh, he weakened the regulations on, on the disposal of toxic coal ash. He lowered fuel efficiency standards so we have less fuel efficient cars. He ended federal, federal regulations on smog. Uh, mountaintop mining removal in places like West Virginia has been polluting rivers in the underground aquifer. Trump limited that. And the list goes on and on and on and on. Um, Biden has been overturning most of those through his creative executive orders. Biden has reinstated our federal ethics rules. He closed the Trump loopholes, which allowed federal government uh, to buy non-American made goods, even though Trump claimed America first, uh, make America great. He froze most of Trump's final EOs in the final days of the administration, including construction of Trump's wall. Uh, Biden rescinded uh, the Keystone Pipeline. We rejoined the Paris Climate Accord. We are now again pursuing clean air and clean water measures. We are now regulating methane gas emissions after it stopped under, uh, under Trump. And the list goes on, a number of rights. We reaffirmed tribal sovereignty after Trump was uh, diminishing it. And the list goes on and on and on. Um, so. Uh, Here's a list of some of uh, Biden's major pieces of legislation thus far. Just recently, you see the bottom of the list there. Uh, he had a bill uh, to uh, fight against the anti-Asian hate crimes that have been spiking recently as Trump made fun of Kung Flu and uh, people are harassing Asian Americans thinking that they brought, uh, for God's sakes, the uh, virus. Uh, <clears throat> This is some of Biden's uh, uh, objectives and, and, and goals. Uh, this is what he wants to pursue. Uh, R&D and medicine and health, this is desperately overdue. Student loan reform, everybody, tax reform. Biden, just like other Democrats before him, Obama and Clinton, has returned to PAYGO. You heard Senator Berman say earlier, Republicans claim to be fiscally responsible. They're far less fiscally responsible from Democrats if you look at the facts. Republicans go off PAYGO. Uh, Democrats follow PAYGO, which means every time you increase spending, you need to pay for it with an offsetting 
either increase in revenues or reduction in another program. He's still trying on minimum wage, infrastructure, a new Iran deal, racial healing, gun control, and the list goes on and on. I want to end by talking about something important, everyone. I think the biggest challenge before us, and this relates to Israel, it relates to a lot of the things happening. The biggest challenge before Biden is to restore America's standing internationally. You've all heard of the term soft power and hard power. Hard power is obvious. Tanks, you know, warplanes. America is the world's biggest economy. People want to invest in the U.S. That's hard power. Soft power is the goodwill that we've built up over years. The focus on soft power began with Harry Truman, who rebuilt Europe with the Marshall Plan, rebuilt Asia, who promoted decolonization. So colonial uh, powers in Europe had to free their colonies and we helped to fund them, promoting things like NATO, uh, promoting food aid uh, and relief around the world. So Truman really built up soft power. For seven plus decades, we have been building soft power. In four years, Trump eliminated all of the soft power that has been built up since Harry Truman. He withdrew from virtually every major treaty, alliance, and agreement. Here's a partial list. The TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, this was sold to us by Obama as an economic measure. It was, make no mistake about it, it was international security. Roughly a dozen countries in China's backyard, Malaysia, Indonesia, Korea, Vietnam, and Thailand, etc. Too small to stand up to China. China is a security and economic threat. They're building a larger navy. They're claiming sovereign waters and international waters, and the list goes on. Um, so those countries are too small to stand up to China. Obama pivoted toward Asia and aligned the United States and the TPP with all of those small countries. Together, we can all stand up to China and serve as a bulwark or a buttress to China. What did Trump do? He gave China the biggest gift it's ever gotten. He withdrew from the TPP, which enhanced China's power for years to come. It showed all those countries in the region that you cannot count on the U.S. We will align with a dictator in China more than you. China brilliantly, I assume after they picked themselves off the floor laughing, brilliantly offered those countries their own economic agreement, and they all aligned with China instead of us. Trump withdrew from the Iran nuclear deal with no substitute and no thought. And of course, uh, <clears throat> if you want Iran to get a nuke, withdraw unilaterally, then unilaterally, and that would prompt them to do it. It worried uh, other countries with potential nuclear, nuclear aspirations, like Egypt uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, Turkey. Um, he withdrew from the Paris Climate Accord, uh, and I think we were only one of what about three countries along with like Iran and Syria to do that. Uh, he withdrew from a multilateral agreement to keep a check on North Korea, thus giving his good friend Kim Jong-un uh, a big pat on the back when the whole world was concerned about this. He withdrew from the INF, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Agreement, which all of Europe was aghast. The only one that wanted to withdraw from open skies and INF was Putin, because it kept an eye on him. Trump took Putin's word and benefit over the international community in the US. He withdrew from the UN Human Rights Commission. He withdrew from UNESCO, which is the UN's educational, scientific, and cultural organization that preserves places like Machu Picchu, Easter Island, and the Great Barrier Reef. He ended our normalization outreach with Cuba, uh, the list goes on, everybody. You can see the, the here. Uh, one of the things that I found to be most shocking, the State Department, of course, has always monitored international arms trafficking. Trump refused to allow the State Department to do that. The State Department was forbidden under Trump from monitoring international arms trafficking. Why? Because Trump, good, Trump's good friends, dictators in North Korea, Russia, and elsewhere, always have their fingers on international arms trafficking. Uh, he withdrew from sites. Uh, from the enforcement of sites, which is the Conference on International uh, Treaty, the Conference on International Trade of Endangered Species. He withdrew from the World Health Organization in the middle of a global health pandemic. He didn't staff our embassies and so on. As a result, you can see here, I put some numbers up for you. The image of the United States all around the world was grotesquely tarnished, tarnished uh, during Donald Trump. Look at the numbers of precipitous drop 
in confidence and support for the United States. Uh, Trump was a go-it-alone isolationist. And of course, this undermined the seven plus decades of soft power and international goodwill build up uh, by the United States. In my opinion, that is our biggest uh, challenge uh, to get ourselves back in the saddle internationally from the absolutely ruinous uh, wrecking ball that was Donald Trump. So Joe Biden has a long road to hoe here on the farm, uh, and we have a lot in front of us. Uh, unfortunately, the clock is ticking because 2022 is coming up, and we'll probably lose seats in the Senate, and thus control the Senate, uh, which means we need to push this stuff through within the next year. All hands on deck. Uh, so thanks again, Ken uh, and uh, Ed and Paul and everybody for the opportunity to uh, address everyone. Thank you, and thank you, Senator Berman and, and Representative Polsky for uh, attending the program. Robert, what is the story with the filibuster? What are your feelings about the filibuster? I have always opposed the filibuster. Uh, here's the irony. Republicans claim to be originalists. That is, they look at the Constitution originally as it was conceived during the hot, humid summer of 1787 in Philadelphia. The filibuster is not a part of the Constitution, which is, which is a grotesque irony. Um, so no, we need to get rid of the filibuster. 60 should not be the new 50. Uh, if you go back and you read the founders, you read the framers, you read the Federalist Papers from Hamilton, Madison, and John Jay, it's crystal clear that they wanted a simple majority for that. The only cases where they did not want a simple majority is you have the two thirds or supermajority, you know, for uh, adding a state or uh, an amendment to the Constitution or things of that effect. So they were crystal clear when they wanted a supermajority. Uh, if they wanted a filibuster, they would have said it. They would have written it. Uh, so they didn't. So we need to get rid of the damn thing. What we have now is Mitch McConnell is holding the entire nation hostage. You could have measures that enjoy 80 percent approval. You, what did we see? Uh, Nancy Pelosi in the final years of Trump's pre final year of Trump's presidency, the Democrats had bills for COVID relief. The Republicans were saying schools need to open, and they didn't provide schools with the penny they needed to open. Can you imagine the costs that poor schools uh, incurred to try to socially distance, get more disinfectant, air purification systems to adapt to this changing situation? And there were bills and measures to provide funding that sat on Mitch McConnell's desk. Mitch McConnell, through the filibuster and his behavior and procedural gimmicks, has been one person has been holding up the entire nation's legislative agenda. So I've always opposed, Paul, I've always opposed the filibuster, no matter who's in office, because that's not what the framers wanted. The question, though, is that uh, can the Democrats convince uh, Manchin and Sinema to go ahead and uh, bust the filibuster? Hasn't happened thus far. You know, um, I wonder. We need to give it serious thought because we're staring down the barrel of 2022. Either that or we need to find a way of hustling these measures through as much as we can. But, yeah, the filibuster could derail the entire legislative agenda for the next four years. It's alarming. Oh, uh, uh, Robert, Robert, Robert Kinley is here, everybody. So we need to... Uh, yeah, Robert, this is here. So. I have a question that I need to uh, address. Uh, our nation currently is a national crisis and uh, the voting rights is only one issue but how does the republican party compare say to the fascist Bundespartei party of the 30s where america was going down a dark hole and we're doing it again so i'd like to have your opinion on that hi alan so thanks for that uh you always have a good question for me um so um so I would never make any comparison to Hitler. Uh, my whole 30-year career as a professor, uh, there is no comparison to what the Nazis did and the world's worst case of genocide with the Holocaust. However, Alan, I do make parallels to the rise of fascism with today's Republican Party. If you look at what a fascist really is, it's unmistakable that Donald Trump was a fascist and not a Republican. What we saw in the 30s all across Europe, it was a period of economic crisis, a period of fear, and we saw Germany went with fear in getting behind Hitler, and Italy went with fear with Mussolini, Franco in Spain, uh, Salazar in Portugal, Tojo in Japan. All across the world, we chose fear, but not in the United States. We picked FDR. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. We rejected fascist fear mongering. The Republicans in the last few years have been relying on scapegoating, blame mongering, fear mongering. Um, an audit 
autocratic leader, a blind allegiance to that autocratic leader. These are the hallmarks of fascism. Vigilantism, how do you explain January 6th? That's part of fascism. You know, George Washington and the founder, you know, I apologize. You, all of you know me. You know, I always go back to the framers. Um, at the Constitutional Convention, Washington, Hamilton, and John Adams had a grave concern. Uh, they thought we had done as best as we could with the Constitution. But, you know, we have a system of checks and balances. We had impeachment. We had an electoral college, all designed so we would not elect some autocratic, authoritarian dictator wannabe. Uh, they thought we had designs in place. The one concern that Washington and Adams and Hamilton talked about was this. What happens if our political leaders put loyalty to their faction ahead of loyalty to the Constitution and the country? And by faction today, we would say party. That's exactly what the Republican Party has done. They put their loyalty to an autocratic fascist, you know, a failed developer, a reality TV show, Donald Trump, ahead of the Constitution, and there's no place clearer than that than the assault on voting rights, uh, as well as the procedural gimmicks uh, that Trump got away with, uh, ignoring subpoenas and so forth and so on. So, yeah, I would make that analogy. I would not take the next step behind that, though. Uh, Dan has a question. Dan Goldstein. Oh, you're I'm muted. Good. You have to unmute yourself, Dan. Dan, unmute yourself. I, I, I got it. Thank you. Always a pleasure to hear you speak, uh, Dr. Watson. Uh, uh, they stole my thunder before, but now I'm going to turn it on to you. How would you advise uh, President Biden and his administration to twist the arms of, of uh, Joe Manchin and, and Cinema to get them? How would you advise them to get them to get on board? Because if they don't, then his whole agenda is going to go nowhere. Go to the people. Uh, we've already seen Biden, Jill Biden, have been in West Virginia, canvassing West Virginia. They need to go to the people with Jill Biden's message and that they are there for military families. Despite Trump's rhetoric, he was not there for military families. West Virginia has a disproportionately large number of veterans, military families. They need to go there and talk about health care for veterans. They need to go there and talk about clean water. West Virginia other than Texas and Louisiana, some of the most polluted water in the country because of the mountaintop removal. And Trump removed the regulations governing mountaintop removal. Uh, it's neither left nor right. It's Main Street America. It's common sense. You need to frame the issues. You need to be on the ground. You need to talk about clean water, healthy for kids. You need to talk about schools. You need to talk about military families. You need to talk about all those things that would resonate with the average West Virginia voter. Biden needs to unleash his secret weapon, Jill. They need to get Doug Emhoff. They need to get celebrities. They need to get popular Democrats. They need to get as many people as they can on the ground um, with that message. If the people of West Virginia, if that message resonates through proper framing, marketing, uh, that'll put pressure on Manchin. Manchin's a politician. Manchin will respond to re-election, re-election, and re-election. Um, he's not going to respond to rational... He's not going to respond to ideological arguments. He's not going to respond to, hey, Joe, this is the right thing to do. Your legacy in the history books is at stake. He will respond to not getting reelected. So I say go to the people. Think of uh, Harry Truman. Um, Truman had no business winning in 1948. Dewey was going to win. He had no business winning. What did Truman do? He got aboard his train, the Ferdinand Magellan. He put enough miles on that train to go to the moon and back. He went to every one-stop sign town all across the heartland. And he went to the people with the kind of framing that I always talk about. Truman would get up on the back of his train in a town of 400 people who had never thought they'd meet a president, a town of farmers. And this is what he would say to them. He would say, I know you're not going to agree with everything I'm about to tell you. But I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you it's because I believe it, not because of a poll. I asked that you wait and boo me until the end. And he would laugh and laugh and laugh. And then he would he would have he would tell them about he would I interviewed several of Truman's former aides who were on the whistle stop, two of his speechwriters in particular, Ken Heckler and Milton Kale. And I asked them about what Truman did on the whistle stop. They said the most brilliant thing ever, he sent his speechwriters to all the towns ahead of him, and he told them to look up three things. Lori, here's a good one for you and Tina for your campaign. Number one, 
Every little town has a soldier on a statue in the downtown. He said, tell me, who is that soldier and what's that story? Number two, uh, what's the local high school football team's record? Because it's the fall. Number three, how is the harvest? Because these are agricultural areas. What are they growing? What are they getting per bushel? And Truman would get up on the back of the train and said, I heard you're only getting, you know, 25 cents a bushel. You ought to be getting, what, 50? I was a former farmer. He would say it was probably that rainstorm on August 28th. People are thinking, how does this guy know this? Then he would tell them, but if you vote for me, I'm going to give him hell like your high school football team did last week when you beat Thomas Jefferson High 14 to 7. People are thinking, how would he know that? And then Truman would talk about veterans. He would tell them the story of that soldier who made the ultimate sacrifice. And Truman would remind them that he was a soldier in World War I. He killed men. He saw men die. He led men in combat. And he would remind them of the ultimate sacrifice that we need to always remember our soldiers. And Truman was a believable guy. So he went to the people. And he took his message and he framed it brilliantly. No highfalutin rhetoric in terms that everybody could understand. And he pulled off one of the greatest upsets in American history. Biden can do the same. Biden is no Obama. Biden is no Bill Clinton. But what Joe Biden is is Scranton Joe. The people in West Virginia understand Scranton Joe. Biden needs to just roll up the sleeves and talk the way he talks, send surrogates out, and be there all day with those simple messages that resonate. That's what I would tell them. We're going to send you to Washington. Uh, send me to class tomorrow. <laughs> and I see my friends, uh, Les and Linda, have a question. Yeah, uh, Robert, talking about local politics, we're getting back to local politics. How do we get preference voting in Florida? Because I think that that is a way to get better candidates running for office. Uh, what I'd say, I've written about this, but only from an academic or theoretical perspective. There's a guy named Yuri Konikov who has a, uh, a nonprofit that, that's pushing uh, this. Uh, I would throw this over to Senator Berman or Representative Polsky if they want to talk about any local issues and and election reform. God knows we need election reform in Florida, given what the, the governor and the Republicans have just done with the Voting Rights Act. Uh, Senator Berman or Rep. Polsky, anything on what we can do to push back on what DeSantis has signed in terms of voting here in Florida? Yeah, I mean, I think somebody wrote in the chat room, maybe it, we need to use it for motivation, and that's what we need to do. Uh, I will tell you, the la last month, the Republicans out-registered us for voter registration. So we have our work cut out for us. We need to be out there telling, you know, getting people registered, telling them our story. Um, you know, we're outnumbered in Tallahassee, so we're not going to be able to do anything in Tallahassee. And um, I have to, spoken to Yuri about preference voting. Um, it's a tough situation because if you had the kind of preference voting that um, some people advocate for, the last two candidates for governor would have been um, two Republicans. Yes. So um, we don't always want to have preference voting. I, I wouldn't have wanted to have two Republicans on the ballot, but I do think we do need to um, do some changes in terms of uh, our elections, but we're not going to do anything until we get more Democrats registered and voting. So yeah. grassroots. Goals. Excuse me. I agree completely with Senator Berman uh, on that. And yeah, that's why Republicans were pushing that amendment the last time around, because in a lot of places, you'd have two Republicans running. Uh, Commissioner McKinley, thank you for reminding me. Uh, Tina, I said representative, not Senator Polsky. I apologize. Uh, I'm on three days now without sleep, as you can all probably tell from my eyes. I just finished a series of deadlines. I think I slept Sunday. Uh, Senator Polsky, anything you wanted to add? And I agree with Senator Berman completely. Um, thank you. Yeah, I think well, the message I've been trying to tell folks, especially Democratic clubs, is to not lose hope um, in getting the vote out. We can still vote by mail. We just have to go within you know, the regular hours of voting. I would encourage people to vote by mail in the mailbox. Just do it early, and then you can track the vote. So don't rely on those um, drop boxes. I think we just have to, when it gets to election time, I think we just have to be really specific on how the law changed and just be careful. I think the biggest problem for us is in our senior communities, when people pick up a lot of these um, sealed mail-in ballots and bring them to the supervised elections, that is one practice that's gonna have to change. But other than that, 
you know, if we encourage people just to put it in the mail, the mail seems to be working much better now. And I think it certainly will be, you know, come election time. And just track it, just do it early. That's the most important thing. I think we get into trouble when people try to get their ballot in last minute. And that's when you come up against these, some of these hurdles that they're trying to put forward. But other than that, I don't think that it should affect the way that we vote and the fact that we need to get out and vote. And, um, you know, that's what I'm going to always encourage people to do. Yeah. And uh, with respect to registering Democrats, a couple of new groups have popped up. I'm going to find the name and put it in the chat. Uh, they're looking for donations. We're looking for our Stacey Abrams. I know that we all are. Um, and there are some groups that have started to try to do uh, voter registration. So let me find the name and I'll put it in the chat. And that's a way for all of us to get active right now when there's not, we don't have our candidates yet and we don't have our election set. So uh, we just have to make sure that everybody's registered. With all these people moving from the north or wherever, we have to make sure that our new neighbors are registered. And yeah. if you register at the DMV, it's very possible you can be registered, registered as an NPA. You have to really affirmatively make sure that you're registered in the party and then you can vote in the primary. So we have to, there's just too many NPAs. That's a problem for us as well. We need to encourage people to register. Yeah, that's been, uh, you're right, that's been one of the fastest growing. I've been saying, Senator Berman and Senator Polsky, that one of the positive, one of the very, maybe the only positive of what the Republicans and the governor just did is they did it early, which means we have a lot of time to get ready. Uh, if this thing came out, you know, months and months later, we'd be scrambling. We have plenty of time to uh, make amendments make amends and uh, prepare. Commissioner uh, McKinley, did you want to add anything? Melissa? Uh, yeah, Dr. Watson, thank you. Um, and I, I'm with you. I think a few of the viewers may have caught me nodding off. It's been a long three days, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I turned my camera off, took a sip of coffee, turned my camera back on. But now, I, Senator Berman, Senator Polsky did a tremendous job trying to push back on that legislation. Um, you know, I'm wearing a hat this year as president of the Florida Association of Counties, and we certainly took a stand on that because it was a direct attack on home rule authority. Um, that seems to be the other thing that uh, this Republican-led legislature and across the nation, not just in Florida, um, one of their other go-to tactics seems to be to weaken city and county governments across the country. Um, a lot of the city governments tend to lean a little bit more to the left and um, we see that as a, as a direct threat on our ability to do anything. But it's just the way that they keep digging away at the you know, power among Democrats. And until we get changes in the legislature and until we get more Lori Bermans and Tina Polskys and until we change the governor's office and the cabinet, um, I, I fear for the future that we're just gonna see more and more nonsense like we've seen this year. This was the worst year for the attack on home rule authority. And, no question. Uh, no question. Yeah, so that's all I would add right now. Yeah, right here in Florida. And what hypocrisy from the Republicans who favor decentralization and small government. What grotesque hypocrisy. Um, but you see that with the Republicans on the Supreme Court, uh, repeatedly overturning what they profess to claim, uh, profess to believe. So. Yeah, uh, let me get one more. I think maybe has, has a question. Robert, uh, okay, I was just, was just going to make a, a comment, Dr. Wasson, that in Georgia, I don't know if you can hear me okay. I see yeah. you in the ear. It was one. Now I can. Now I can. Okay. Uh, I was just going to make a comment. I saw Ben Rhodes, who was part of the Obama administration, was on the Rachel Maddow show last night, and he has a new book out called After the Fall. It is talking about the fall of democracy talks about uh, the fall of democracy in countries like India and Turkey and um, you know these authoritarians that have started to take over and uh, he was saying that we should the ones who are pro-democracy should find a way to link with all of these different uh, countries globally people who are pushing for democracy because we are really in serious peril here. No, I, I agree. Uh, thank you, Nadine. And I think that Nadine just gave Democrats another frame. This is not just an election coming up. This is a struggle for democracy. The Republicans have declared war on democracy and on the Constitution in so many different ways. And, you know, the laundry list is gigantic, so we're, we don't have a shortage of examples. We have to find a smart way of talking about it and framing it. Um, I was always an optimist. Um, 
people that have known me my whole life have never seen me get mad or lose my temper, and I've always been upbeat. Friends used to tease me like I was Pollyanna and the sun shining. Robert's here. Um, but uh, for the last four years, I've been saying to all my friends and, and at conferences and all that, that this doesn't end well. <clears throat> I've been saying for four years it doesn't end well. I mean, Trump was almost reelected, everybody. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, I was telling friends, oh, my God, the pandemic is Trump's chance to make everybody forget all the fascist and idiotic things he's done, uh, making fun of a disabled reporter, bragging about molesting women, making fun of Gold Star families, making fun of POWs and uh, John McCain, an American hero. Um, the, the pandemic gave him an opportunity with Americans with short memories. If he would have just handled this in an average way, instead of a, an historic, colossally bad response, if he had just been remotely normal, uh, he could have won this thing. Remember, he almost won. Uh, what does it say? When the Republican Party can be blatantly racist, blatantly anti-Semitic, blatantly homophobic, back the January 6th insurrectionists, and that's not the first time we saw an insurrection in Charlottesville. Uh, uh, you know, the Republican Party was long ago okay with high schools being shot up. They were long ago okay with movie theaters being shot up. Now they're okay with elementary schools and supermarkets being shot up. Uh, what does it say when the Republicans picked up seats across the country in 2020 and Trump almost won? You know, almost half the country has rejected science, rationality, reason. We're in the grips of fear and blame mongering. I really think these are perilous times. I'm, I'm more concerned now than I've been any time. I'm 59, any, even though I look like I'm 29, right? <laughs> Thanks for nodding your head, Lori. Um, I'm more concerned now than I've ever been in my life. Um, and I travel, at least before the pandemic. I usually visit around six colleges a year, at least a dozen museums and battlefields a year. Uh, you know, uh, I, I go to on a book tour every year for my new books. So I, every other weekend, I'm out all around the country. And I'm here to tell you that in the last several years, Israel has lost the college campus. Not is losing, present tense, past tense, is lost. Uh, and it's nonsense from BB and others that are, uh, and the BDS movement and the Students for Justice in Palestine. All around the country, uh, if I'm speaking in Missouri, because that's where my buddy Harry was from, or in the heartland, I always, always have people at my talks that tell me to F myself and leave this country. And they have red hats on. And I'm, I'm talking about, good God, you know, the founding fathers of the Battle of Gettysburg, D-Day. It doesn't matter what I'm talking about. The anger, the irrationality. You know, maybe we're in a bubble in Democratic Palm Beach County. Uh, you know, I know so many people on this call. You're well-read, you're well-traveled, you're well-educated. We have Polskys and Bermans and Deutsches and Frankels and McKinleys as our, as our leaders. You know, we're blessed. Travel. Uh, get out of this bubble. It's shocking. Uh, the things that I hear when I'm out. I, I really don't think this ends well. I think we need, as I said, all hands on deck. Look at what DeSantis has gotten away with. And and, and the conventional wisdom is he'll win re-election easily, and he's, he's, you know, he's being hyped for the presidency. This guy should be in jail. Uh, this is shocking uh, what's, what's happening. So I, I you know, I, I'm no longer an optimist. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a realist who's marginally hopeful. Um, but uh, we really need all hands on deck, everybody. I really think this is a crisis. I agree with what Nadine said. Uh, and I just want to thank everybody for the opportunity. I didn't mean to digress too much onto a soapbox or into, uh, you know, grandfather clauses, literacy tests, and Plessy versus Ferguson, but ask a professor, ask an historian to talk about it. You're lucky I didn't go all the way back to the Big Bang. <laughs> so, uh uh, Lori and Tina and Melissa and everybody, it's good to see you again. Uh, thanks to uh, uh, to the club, to Ed and Dr. Ken and Paul and everybody for the opportunity. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you, Robert. We appreciate your appearance. I want to also thank all the, all the attendees of tonight's South County Democratic Club meeting uh, via Zoom. We hope to soon resume our in-person meetings, um, maybe by the fall. This time, I would like to recognize the uh, United South County Democratic Club board members, Ed Saul, President, Debbie Cantor, Ken Summers, Carol Estes, Toby 
Steve Solomon, Arnold Millett, Nate Smith, Barbara Irov, Gil Hendler, Bert Bauman, Sandy Kravitz, and uh, I want to wish you all a good evening and uh, stay safe and uh, vote Democratic. Good night. Good night, all.